So good evening, everybody. I think we are on the 13th of August tonight. It is wonderful to share this podcast with you. Wonderful to have your ear. And let me just start off right from the bat. What is this podcast about? Um, this is about my current series, which is about the 22 reasons to stop believing in God. I'm at Rebuttal 7, and I, I hear that lots of people don't understand what Rebuttal means. Rebuttal means that I am opposing these ideas, these reasons to stop believing in God. So this is the seventh podcast dealing with that. And tonight I'll be dealing with number 13 and 14 of the 22 reasons that has been given why it is a good idea to stop believing in God. I know many people have looked at this, this heading and said, well, how could you, how could you support atheism? That is not at all the case. I am opposing the ideas of atheism and maybe the word rebuttal is misunderstood by people or, um, well, tonight you're learning a lesson then. Rebuttal means you oppose it. You, you give an answer to, um, the uh, claims that has been made. So, I have covered so far 12 objections to belief in God. I'm not going to go over those again. You're welcome to go check that out in the previous uh, podcasts. And I just want to give the introduction so that you know if you want to listen further, you're welcome to listen further. If you, if you don't want to, you can clutch out. But this is what this uh, podcast will be about. Why does God not just appear and take away our suffering? Or why doesn't he just appear and show himself to us? Why is he so hidden? Okay, Lots of people would say, well, if God is real, then why doesn't he just come down and show us all and we'll all believe in him? I think that's a valid question to address, which I'll be talking about tonight. But in specifically in relation to the Holocaust, the great suffering that took place there and why God didn't intervene there. OK, and then the second thing I'm going to be talking about is just about this idea that, that a lot of people bring up. A lot of Christians bring up when they say that I experience God, I feel God, therefore God must be real. Is that a valid argument? Because from an atheist perspective, that perhaps doesn't look like one. So let me read to you the actual words um, of what the criticism is of religion or Christianity or belief in God. Um, number 13, the guy said just the Holocaust. The Holocaust in his mind, that is evidence that God does obviously doesn't exist. I'm going to explain that in a moment. Number 14 was, this is his own words. The proof of people give or the proof people give for why God exists is so often based on their personal experiences. You know, God spoke to them. They feel God. They just know God exists. It is the sort of proof we would never take seriously if it were applied anywhere else. Okay, so let me start with the first one, number 13, the Holocaust. Um, now, he doesn't explain further what he means or what his argument is. And for in case you're listening or looking at this little video, um, the Holocaust was basically what happened in World War II when these uh, six million Jews were killed. OK, um, the, the Holocaust, you know, people were placed in gas chambers. People were killed brutally by the, the Nazis. Um, it was an extremely bad thing that happened. You know, six million people being wiped out. Um, it was gruesome. People begged God from all over the world to stop this, these atrocities taking place. Why didn't he? If he exists, why didn't he? Why did God not intervene in the Holocaust? Well, um, they would say because he doesn't exist. If there was a loving God, as the Bible claims, then he would have intervened, surely. Obviously, if he didn't, then God doesn't exist. That is the argument. If God existed and he is who he claims to be, um, the God of love, then suffering would not be on this planet. And if you're listening to this, I'm sure that you've had suffering in your life and you've asked this question before. Why did my dad die when I was young? Or why did my mother get cancer? Uh, why am I sick, for example? And why doesn't God intervene if he's this God of love? Um, I mean, with the, with, with the Holocaust, it was a perfect time for God to say, all right, I'm going to send 10 million angels quickly to the earth. I'm going to take out the Nazis. Isn't that a perfect time for him to do that? So let's, let me make a few comments about that. I think that's quite a, um, an understandable argument that people would make to say, look, God doesn't exist because if he did, he would have done something about it. So the first question I would like to ask is the following. Who caused it? That's the first thing I would say. Well, who caused the Holocaust? 
um, who caused the pain and the suffering that took place there during the Second World War when many people were killed. Um, and I think you know who it is. It was Hitler and his cronies. Um, it was evil men, specifically, interestingly, atheists who were influenced by a Darwinian worldview. Now, Darwinian worldview is an evolutionary worldview. Uh, the Holocaust was the extermination of a race that was considered to be unfit and unpure or impure to live. Hitler literally believed the Jews were not worthy to live. They were an impure race. Now, where did these guys get the idea, let's kill all these, let's, let's kill the impure races? Where, where does that come from? Well, believe it or not, through evolution, which was put on the map by Charles Darwin. Now, on the front page of the book he published, The Origin of Species, I'm going to read to you the exact words. It goes like this. Preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Now, just think about that. Preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Do you know what that means? Okay. It's okay for non-favored races to die off the Jews, in order to preserve favored races, the Germans. Isn't that, that interesting? It's okay to kill them off because the favored races can survive. And so this, this theory of evolution proposed by Darwin uh, sort of um, spearheaded that or supported that idea. It's okay to kill the Jews. Survival of the fittest, right? We've heard that before, right? If it happens in the animal kingdom, if the species that are not good enough start to die out, that's an okay thing. And so we just, we're just helping along the process of evolution to take out um, some of the races that are not worthy to continue into um, all of eternity. It's, you know, and it's interesting that the people who don't believe in God, listen to this, that the people who don't believe in God points to what people who didn't believe in God did to prove that God doesn't exist. The people who instigated the atrocities of what happened in the Second World War, of the, of the Holocaust, the people who committed those atrocities, they were atheists holding on to a naturalistic worldview. But maybe, maybe, you know, we want to see what God can do, right? When we look back at the Holocaust, we want to say, well, God, where are you? Why, why don't you intervene? We want to see what God can do. But maybe God allowed the Holocaust so that we can see what human beings can do. Maybe that's why he allowed it. So that we can wake up and see that when men become more evil, how devastating that is and how earth becomes hell in a way. They say that most of the people who, um, were of, who, or who participate in genocide are normal people. People like you and me. Well, I hope you're normal. I consider myself to be fairly normal. Um, you know, many of the Nazi soldiers, they were normal people. Maybe God allowed it to happen to show the human race. You see what happens when naturalistic atheism is allowed to reign. You look at what happens, right? Okay. When you start believing that you are animals, you will start treating each other like animals. That's maybe a huge message from God. Every, the whole world was going um, crazy about this theory of evolution by Darwin. And maybe God said, okay, let me interject here. Let, let's see what happens if, if I let you fall into the idea that you guys are just animals, you come from animals, and we throw away the morality of it all. Let me prove to you it's not a good idea. And as I've said in so many previous podcasts, we are not animals. We are above the animals. Okay. That's my first sort of idea that I would just bring across is that um, we are angry that God didn't intervene in what happened at the Holocaust, but we don't sit back for a moment and think, well, um, who caused the Holocaust and why was it caused? It wasn't caused by God. Okay. So that's the first point I'd like to say. The second point I'd bring up is this. Who says it was a bad thing? An atheist complains that what happened at the Holocaust was it was, it was a bad thing, like six million Jews died. But who says it was wrong? Who says it's wrong? Evil does not exist unless good exists, right? And if God does not exist, then how do we determine what is right and wrong? What is good and evil if God doesn't exist? Because in the atheist mind, God doesn't exist. So where does he get good and evil fr from? How do you determine what is good and what is evil outside of yourself, uh, not in your subjective understanding. If we are all just animals, as atheism claims, then why does it matter? Why does it matter? 
Okay, what is wrong with genocide? If we're just all animals, what does it matter? Why worry about six million Jews dying? Um, hey, I mean, think about it. More food and money for us, right? Apparently, the Jews are quite wealthy. I mean, let's take them all out. We've got more bucks for ourselves and, and more chow. I mean, less people on the earth. Great. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> right? Well, well you, you might say, well, animals do not commit genocide. Um, they do. Ants go to war against other colonies. They would take out a whole other co colony if they wanted to. Japanese giant hornets. They eradicate beehives regularly. Tens of thousands of bees they kill within a few hours. In years of plenty, talk about the snowy owls. They kill so many lemmings that they opt to make nests out of the carcasses that they do not eat. Once their eggs hatch, much more lemmings will die to feed the rapidly growing chicks. So, so atheists use morals to prove a moral God does not exist. The very fact that atheists are upset about the Holocaust proves God's existence because we all know all humans are intrinsically valuable. God's ex God exists because we can sense the moral um, compass within us. We know it. We feel it in our gut. The moral law of God has been um, placed in our hearts, but not in that of animals. We know we are special. We are above the animals. But we don't want to acknowledge that. Because if we do, then we've got to admit sort of that we've possibly been made into the image of a moral God. And we, don't, we want to avoid that as, as atheists. Then there's a third point. The, the third point is this. God did stop the Holocaust. We, we can't say he didn't stop it. He, he possibly did stop it. Many people who are aware of the history and were perhaps situated in that difficult time would say that the, the, the end of the war came quite powerfully. They just stopped. Perhaps it was stopped at exactly the right time. And perhaps it was instigated by God. People have long spoken about what if it was never stopped? What if it never ended? You know what? It could have infiltrated the whole world and taken over all the nations of the world. Millions of casualties would have been nothing. Six million Jews would have been nothing. We're talking about hundreds of millions of people who would have died. Also, take note that this wasn't the first time that the Jews were killed. If you go read the stories of the Jews, the history of the Jews, you see that the Babylonians killed them too. The Assyrians killed the Jews too. These facts are situated in history. The Germans weren't the first people to take out the Jews. It, it's nothing new. And what is quite interesting is why did the Nazis specifically target the Jews? Out of all the nations on earth, why the Jews, ladies and gentlemen? The people of God. The covenantal people of God, the people of Israel, every other time the Jews were killed, it was allowed by God to discipline his nation with the goal of glorifying himself. These are some things to consider. The Holocaust might just be more evidence for God than against God. And then there's a fourth thing, and this is the answer that most people just love when we talk about these types of things. Well, I don't know why God didn't intervene. Don't we just love it when people say, I don't know. I, I don't know why he didn't stop it earlier. Um, I do know that he does everything at the right time in accordance with his divine mind and power and will. And we see that clearly in nature. The seasons come at the right time. The sun comes up at the right time. The earth is in perfect e equilibrium. Um, everything has been created to just go on in exactly the right time. Otherwise, we would have been extinct by this time. So I believe God does things at the right time. The moment I can understand all the variables of God, the moment I can understand it all, then I will be God. All right. Many have pointed out the good that came from the Holocaust. And there has been many good. It's, it's hard to point out all of that. And we will never be able to measure it. But I mean, from the psych psychology theories of men like Viktor Frankl and his uh, logotherapy to numerous testimonies that have been given over the years that have changed people's hearts all the way to the policies that the World War II have brought about, like, for example, the, and the, the founding of the Jewish nation in Israel, for example. So if we sit down and we're trying to um, write down a list of all the positive things out of the Holocaust, I'm sure that we'll be able to get some things. But the true measure of it um, is, is difficult for us. Only a God would be able to comprehend that. We don't know how many people's, Lives have been changed through those atrocities. And we don't know how many people's lives will still be changed in the years to come. It's the things that remain in God's domain. Some people might say, 
Wow, what got you? There you go. Got you. You don't know. You don't know. Um, how can you believe in something um, that you don't have the answer for? I would say to you, especially if you're an atheist, the naturalistic, scientific type of person, go speak to your scientist buddies and see how quickly they tell you things that they don't know. People, atheists, often seem to think science knows everything. Science doesn't know everything. There are, there are loads and loads of unknown things um, that scientists know are unknown. They can't figure it out. So science has loads of unanswered questions too. And just because you don't have the answer for something doesn't mean there isn't a valid one. All right. And then finally, we have an issue with evil. That's really the problem because evil caused the suffering of the Holocaust. And I just want to read you something written by a guy by the name of Jason Horsler. I don't know who he is, but I found this and, and I thought it was quite cool. If God exists, then why evil? You ask. If God is God and evil exists, then there must be a very important reason for evil to be temporarily allowed. Let me ask you, is God obliged, being God, to explain why he has allowed evil to exist for the time being? Good also exists. Beauty, truth, food, life, love, blessings. And these are freely given to a creature who is quite capable of gratitude and worship. But instead, mostly chooses at best to ignore the almighty benevolent giver of these gifts and sadly at worst to utterly hate him. The real question should therefore be, if God exists and we ignore him, why is there any good blessings still being given? The answer is the same for both questions. Evil and good exist to show us the character of God, that he is good and loving and also angry and a judge. Without bad and good things in this world, we would not understand hell nor heaven, condemnation nor forgiveness, justice nor mercy. How could you explain hell without reference to pain and fire? How could you explain heaven without reference to love and joy? Without death, eternal life becomes meaningless. Without suffering, who would listen to warning? Some things just to think about. Let's move on. Let's go to the second point for tonight. I'm just going to read the objection to faith quickly the proof people give for why god exists is so often based on their personal experiences you know god spoke to them they feel god they just know god exists it's the, the sort of proof we would never take seriously if it were applied anywhere else firstly let me answer it this way most christians i know don't only give that reason i mean christians we can do a better job if that's the answer that we give. Well, I feel God. I mean, um, I'm not saying it's an invalid reason. I'm just saying that I think we can do a better job. Who am I to say that your experience isn't real? I can't scientifically disprove your experience, but there are many other reasons um, why God exists. Scientific reasons, philosophical reasons, historical reasons. Um, and I agree with this guy that we can't use that only as evidence. You can't use it as evidence to say, well, God exists because I feel him. Um, we can't use people's subjective experiences as evidence unless, and that brings me to the second point, which I think is quite valid. And this is it. That statistics is considered by most people as a science. Um, for example, we estimate that 7 to 10% of the world's population don't believe in a God. Okay, so, so 7 to 10% of the world's population are atheists. Um, that means that the other 90% of the world is hallucinating. Let that sink in. So 90% of the world population who believe that there is a God, they're all just hallucinating. Okay, our subject, uh, our subject of experiences means nothing. Okay, you are right. Unless 3 billion people also claim to have experienced God. Then, um, then it becomes in a way science, doesn't it? Because statistically, uh, who are you going to believe? The majority or the minority? All right. So then subjective experience does matter. And there might be something there. You know, this, Dinesh D'Souza, I just love this guy. He's just such a legend. Uh, he's just good at what he does. Um, you know, he's, he had an argument for it like this. He said, if, if someone said they saw a UFO, okay, um, I would say, well, how do you know? 
Well, um, the answer, the person would answer, I was with my buddies. We were sitting outside the trailer park having a few beers. And then I would say, yeah, I would probably not believe that. If you're sitting outside your trailer park having a few beers, you say you saw a UFO, I'm probably not going to believe that. But we're not talking about things like that. We're talking about billions of people in this world since the beginning of time who say that they've experienced God. Billions of people, not people who sit outside a trailer park and drink beer who experience God. That we could say is hallucination. All right. Now, if we went to a village and there were 100 people in that village, right? Just imagine with me. 90 of them said that they knew a guy by the name of Bill. 10 of them said they do not know him. Okay, three of them thought that the other 90 people were lying or they made him up, which is more likely that there is a bill and that 90 percent uh, are hallucinating. Or is it that there is a bill and five percent just doesn't know the guy, which is more likely? I'm sure you get the argument. So all the millions of people who invest their time and treasure and who have over the last thousands of years and committed themselves to this God, they are all hallucinating. No, I don't think so. I think it's pretty good evidence that so many people have experiences with God. I think that's statistical evidence for the existence of God. Thirdly, someone might say, we can see Bill, but we can't see God. How do you figure that out? You can't use this. This is a bad example. We can see Bill and we can't see God. And here's a bit of a theological argument that I'd like to present. And I, I really would like you to think about this. And if you talk a lot with people who are um, wrestling with the hiddenness of God, they can't see God. This is something interesting you might be able to share with them. Now, the Bible says you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. We find that all over the Bible. The reason why people don't see or experience God is because they're not seeking him. Simple as that. Atheists would often say, well, it's easy. Here I am, God. Come down. Show yourself to me and I will believe. Of course you would. We all would. I mean, if God comes down from heaven right now and he plants himself on the earth, right? And he stands in front of us in all his majesty. We will shake ourselves into a pulp and we will all bow down on our knees before him, which, by the way, is going to happen into the future. All right. That is exactly the problem. That is exactly why God doesn't come, because if he did, we would all just submit. Now, let me explain to you why I say that. And Frank Turek explained this very, very well. Um, imagine a prince of a kingdom. OK, while being out in the fields or something from a distance um, behind some covering or whatever, he saw a beautiful young peasant girl and just the way that this girl behaved and the way she looked he he fell in love with her he couldn't believe that there exists such a beautiful a uh, young woman and so he goes home now he's the prince of the kingdom he goes home to his dad the king and he says to his dad dad you know i saw this beautiful woman she's the most beautiful woman i've ever seen in my life i i want i want to marry her i want to know her i want to have a relationship with her and you know what the father says to him the father says to him if you go to her as you are, and you go to her as the prince, okay, she will be overwhelmed when she realizes that you're the prince, and she will marry you. For sure she will marry you. I mean, think about all the money. Think about the popularity. She's going to come live in a palace. She's not going to be a peasant anymore. But you won't know if she loves you genuinely or not. You won't know if she's really marrying you because she loves you or because she's marrying you because she's overwhelmed. She feels blown away that the prince likes her. You won't know if she's going to marry you because she actually wants to go live in your palace and live a wealthy life. So what you've got to do is you've got to go live, move out of the palace, go live in her village like a peasant, get to know her. Let her get to know you for you are, for who you are, apart from being a prince. That is the only way that you can know in your heart that she loves you for who you are and not because you are the prince. Can you draw the parallel? That is us. Jesus is the prince. He could have come down. He could have come down 2,000 years ago. He could have been walking around the earth. God could be here moving around, however, and shown himself in perfect glory, in majesty, with his billions of angels the whole time, every day, been here. And you know what we would have done? We all would have worshipped him. But we would have worshipped him because we would have been overwhelmed. We would have been scared. And we would, we would have been forced to. Who wouldn't? Here's the thing. God remains hidden for the purpose 
that he doesn't overwhelm us and that he can genuinely find out who is really interested in him. That's why. Jesus is the prince who came to the earth and he lived among us to show us how God feels about us. I hope the point is clear. If God did just arrive, he did just take away our suffering in this powerful way, we will be forced to be overwhelmed. And in a sense, that takes away our free will. And God doesn't want that. He gives us time to come to him freely and to get to know him freely for who he is without the glory and the magnificence that might sway us to come to him because we're overwhelmed. So let me conclude. And usually I give two responses or not two responses, two challenges to the, the atheists out there. Um, and here's my first response, the Holocaust. I just throw it right back. The Holocaust is evidence that evil exists and that people are not happy with it. And that in, its, in itself proves to us that there is a moral standard outside of ourselves that we all agree with. And that means that there must be a lawgiver. If there's a law in our hearts, there must be a lawgiver. And that's evidence for God. Secondly, if Christianity was true, would you become a Christian? That's a, that's a question that I think every atheist needs to think about. If Christianity was true, would you become a Christian? And most honest atheists would say no. Why? Because the real reason why they despise the idea of God because, is because if he existed, they would have to change their ways. And they would have to submit to his moral authority. And they don't want to. And so they criticize Christians for their personal experiences with God, but it is their own personal moral experiences that leads them to disbelieve in God. Atheists don't actually use objective data to conclude God doesn't exist. They use subjective morality. Guys, it's been wonderful. Have a super evening. Love you guys. Don't hesitate to send comments below, ask questions. I will do podcasts in, in the future about that. Don't hesitate contacting me if you disagree or you would like to even chat with me on this show. It would be wonderful to have you. Have a super evening. Cheers. Bye.